Welcome to the Landscaping Podcast. My name is Joel Barnett and I am your host. And in today's episode, I'm talking with Neil Wilson from Terrain Landscapes. Now, Neil is a landscaper based in Auckland in New Zealand. And I was pretty excited to get him on because I've been trying to get on someone from New Zealand for uh, many months. But And I'm getting ghosted. So it was great to have Neil on and I had plenty of questions for him about things like the type of soils and pavers and all sorts of things that they do in New Zealand just to see how different they are to what we do in Australia. And early on, like right at the start, he talked about how when he was studying horticulture in school and he got the top student award for, for his class and how it was a surprise to everyone. And I found that interesting because I, when I started um, doing landscaping and horticulture, it was surprised people about how much I was learning as well at, same, at, that, at that time. And I think it's because when you start doing something that you love, you do it well. So previously, you just, when you're doing school and things like that, you not doing that well because you don't care about it. Whereas you start learning about something that you love, you do well and that, that surprises people, but uh, it makes a lot of sense. So it's good to see when someone finds something that they enjoy doing. And he talks about how he worked in, uh, he traveled over to Sydney and London both to work for a short periods as well. So just getting a bit of a broader range of skills, uh, the way, different way they do things and traveling at the same time. And uh, one of the important things he mentions is the uh, benefits of he only quotes off design. So if you haven't got a design, he won't quote your projects. Um, that's a pretty important thing to do. And he explains why that is. And I asked him about the what the New Zealand landscaping industry is like in terms of camaraderie and uh, helpfulness. So we talk about that and he mentions the benefits of joining the association so you can meet different designers and start doing different things. So there's a lot of uh, good things in this chat with Neil. So hopefully you enjoy this chat with Neil Wilson. Uh, Neil, thank you very much for joining us on the Landscaping Podcast. My first question for you is, how did you start in the industry? Um, a long time ago, mate. I, uh, I've always sort of been a worker. It's all lo- I've just loved to work. So when I was about 10, I got given a bit of a mowing run. Started off at one lawn, so I used to ride my bike down there and go and mow this lawn. And then um, after a while, the neighbour... She was this old lady, actually. She wanted her lawn done, so I started to mow her, her lawn. So it was my sort of first first gig. And then from there, we had to move away, so I had to give up that that job. But from there, sort of just went into school, and school wasn't really my thing. So when you got to choose your uh, subjects, I, I really hated science and ended up going into horticulture as an alternative and loved it sort of um, found that really good, actually ended up getting top student, which was a surprise to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and then from there, we um, during the school holidays, I, I needed to sort of earn money. So I sort of, my parents had a friend who was uh, worked for a landscape company. So I went and did a few days there and then um, saw, the, saw the year out and then sort of told, told mum that school wasn't for me. And she said, fine, but you have to get a job. So I went and worked for that company and, um, yeah, started there, did three years for them. Was that an apprenticeship? Do you have apprenticeships in New Zealand? We do have apprenticeships, but not really back then. So at the time, I went and worked for him for three years and then just when I told him I was actually going to leave and go do some travel overseas, he offered me the apprenticeship. But I didn't actually take him up then. I actually went over to Sydney because I was 18 and wanted to do a bit of travel and over there I sort of I actually struggled to get into the construction side a little bit so I ended up having to do a bit of garden maintenance which isn't sort of what I like but I, I did a little stint at Sydney Uni All right. looking after the grounds there it was a bit of fun nice and cruisy and then um, eventually did some more travel and then sort of came back home and went back to that same company and yeah started my apprenticeship is horticulture something a lot of high schools teach? Not really, and there was only one class. So just you probably had 10 science classes and only one horticulture class. I don't really know about now, but yeah, my teenager hasn't mentioned it at school. So mm. it's probably sort of disappeared. Most people saw it as like the, the way to get out of science. Yeah, it's just a bludge. Uh, so what sort of work did the guy, the company you're working for do? Or we did all high-end residential. So I actually think I probably took it for granted, being my age, how good the work was there. 
I, he's he's probably the best and still is the best in in my opinion that company and what the company stuff, is it? Strass Landscapes. Craig Steiner, he's sort of been heavily involved for oh, about 30, 35 years in the industry. And he um oh yeah, he just he just taught you everything. He'd know if something wasn't level just by talking to you on the phone. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it was he he was he was that he was that good and his attention to detail was that good that you know, um you just were scared to get anything wrong, so you you sort of didn't. <laughs> So did you were you sort of doing um you know learning really fast by getting thrown in the deep end and doing all the the things that you wanted to be doing there? Uh towards the end I did, yeah. Yeah. So the first time it was just a lot of heavy labor, you know, there was quite big sites we were on, so um a lot of labor. Um but then all of a sudden you might be doing some paving, but you'd just be the you'd be the cutter and the mixer. So sometimes, you know, you might have to cut fifty pavers in half. And you know you'd just be you'd be doing that in between putting the brew on, and then you slowly they just got just from there slowly start laying your own and sort of taught you all the techniques and things. It was good, all yeah, all high end, which I sort of like I said took for granted. And so, how long were you there the second time? Second time was four years, and then I sort of got itchy feet again and went and went over to Europe. Over there, I just did six months over there in, in London and sort of worked for a landscape company over there, but sort of then, then came back home. And then I sort of, I looked back at that company, but decided to try my trade elsewhere. So you went and worked for another company or was that when you started your business? Yeah, I went and did another three years for another company and enjoyed enjoyed that a lot of that, but it was a completely different vibe to... The, the other company like it was it was a huge company and you were sort of a bit of a bit of a number and the the owner didn't even sort of come and look at the projects and it was just like it was more money than than what you were doing so after that I decided yeah it's time to put my put my name to something so, so did for- you learn anything about business from the two companies you worked for you're too young to nah like not for the first couple and that towards the second company I worked for a little bit, only mainly because they had they showed you some spreadsheets and how many hours you sort of had to to do a task, which definitely helped moving forward. But other than that, they just sort of say you're under budget or you're over budget, you know, so it's either move faster or move faster. <laughs> and how did you go about starting your own business? I'd been putting the feelers out for a little bit. So I sort of registered the name and it was something I was always always going to do. And then I just sort of started talking to a few designers and, and people like that. And eventually I got a job and it was big enough to sort of take the plunge. So then I sort of, I, I just did it. Did you have any, did you put any staff on early on? Yeah, I had a, um, a young guy who, I'd worked for at another company. He was actually starting his own company, something completely different. But I knew he was a he was a great hard working labourer. So he was he, he was good for me because he'd sort of say I have to. He could only work till two, and then he'd go do his thing. So that was that was quite good. And if he needed days off, he could do it, and it sort of it was yeah quite a good little balance. Yeah. And what about design? Did you do any of that early on? No, no. I I can see what I want in my head. But I can't, I can't put it on paper. Yeah, um, that still the same now. Yeah, yeah. So I sort of just always ask them for, do you have a design? No, I can't draw. If, if you need someone, bring these guys, and then and then come back and see me. Yep. So you got some design who you work with, and you send work each other's way. Yeah, yeah. I've got about three or four that sort of I mainly only work for now, and they keep me pretty busy and if it's sort of that's all I sort of would look at now I sort of yeah the smaller jobs I don't sort of it's, it's a lot of effort for what you get out of it where I'd just rather off a plan it's just so much nicer yeah yeah it's crazy when you think about the amount of time it, because it takes a silly amount of time to quote it like to, you've got to go out to the site and uh, measure it up potentially and then quote it there's not much different on a large job to, compared to a small one but you make a lot more profit hopefully that's what we try to do, yeah. 
you're right though because they're like oh I, I don't know if i want a deck there or i don't know this but by the time you've got the design all those questions have been answered mm. and the design has gone back three or four times already so basically our job is just to look at the site and the access and then yeah see if it's going to be easy easy site or hard how many staff do you have on at the moment uh we've got five now including me which is which is which is good and do you work on the tools or yeah, I'm, I'm full time on the tools still. Um, been trying to get off for a while now, and then um, I had a plan last year. I had knee surgery, so I was like, right, right, this is this is my time. And then COVID hit, and then my my site foreman, who's been with me for a while, his wife was an essential worker, so he couldn't be on site, so he had to be at home with his kids. So back to, back to site I went. Yeah, it has has a body going. Is it holding up all right? It's yeah, I've been doing a, quite a lot of rehab on the knee now. It's pretty good, and try and do a little bit of fitness when I can. If I find if I train and hit the gym, my body's a lot a lot better. But as soon as if I go a month and I don't do any training, then my back sore in the mornings and things like that. But as soon as you exercise, and I find it just it, it's it's a game changer. Yeah, I've only just started doing yeah uh, stuff in the morning. Just it's uh, a little bit of weight, but it's more about movement. It just makes a massive difference in how you feel straight away. Just get the body moving. Yeah, it does. You can sort of, I can go to the gym and ease into it with a little bit of a cycle. And, you know, and I find I also drink a lot more water that time of the morning if you're you're doing something rather than two coffees, you're sort of, you're punching the water back, Mm. which which is great help. What's the breakdown of your staff? Like what sort of people do you have working for you? I've got my site foreman. Who's, who, who does most of the work for us and he's like he, he'd be like an owner almost without without the thing he's, he's great he's been with me for about seven years and i actually took on a roofer about a year and a half ago and he's he, he's been really good so it's just we're just sort of teaching him the actual landscape aspects but as far as it's timber work and boxing and everything like that he's he's all got that and then we've got a older apprentice he's a couple years in and then we've sort of got an older our truck a truck driver is a sort of skilled laborer has been in the industry for a while now so do you do you do a lot of uh, pergolas and that sort of thing that need the roofs no we don't actually sort of we sort of do a few lubertech systems luber roofs but we wouldn't do that ourselves we sort of uh we'll do the footings and whatever they need in the ground and then they'll sort of come in and put the them up themselves so are you doing like high-end projects as well like similar to what you're working on beforehand yeah we go between pretty high end and then sort of a mix of of medium high which is which is quite yeah sometimes the high ends that can drag out quite a while Mm. i think we worked on one on and off last year which was over a year-long project which you sort of towards the end you just want to see the end result yep I saw on your Instagram uh, one of your projects sold for eleven point five million. Like, yeah, as well, was that that project or was it another big one? No, no, that one wasn't too bad for us because the builders did all the block work. It was quite elevated, um, but the builders did a lot of that. But that was our first sort of introduction to bringing stuff in by conveyors. Oh yeah. So that was sort of I think one day we brought in forty cube by um, conveyors. I had five guys waiting at the end of the barrow. <laughs> you know just, just don't let it drop <laughs> so but yeah that, that was yeah that was pretty high end and that again that was quite a high end designer that um that lady so it's quite quite good everything she touches is nothing but high end yeah cool <laughs> what are those conveyors like because i've seen people use them but i've never actually used one myself but do you do they get clogged up with material or anything uh you probably don't want to do wet clay but if you've got we do a lot of sand lawns and and um, topsoil and things like that, and and it's real good as long as it's dry. And we normally just make sure someone's sort of running up and down and just checking because if there's if one stops, it backs up pretty quick. But mm. yeah, as, as long as the the rollers are clean, it's been great for either in and out. Yeah. And is it is it mainly when there's uh, elevation changes, or is it just the skinny access? Uh, both, both. So we're actually on a project at the moment. The pool builders are there now and they hired the digger in and everything's been like conveyed out. 
because oh. yeah, the staircase is pretty is pretty steep. But how'd they get the excavator in? A uh, high ab, like a oh a crane. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh sorry, yeah. yeah. Because it, I've been to uh, Auckland in New Zealand uh, about twenty years ago, and it's, there's not many flat spots in Auckland, that's, and that's where you work mainly, is it? Uh, yeah, all Auckland. Yeah, we and we tend to get a lot of the tricky ones for some reason. Like, there's one design, that, yeah, one design. I'm like, what do you do to me every time? You know, where you're grazing your knuckles on the house as you're pushing a barrow, but once you get into the backyard, they're quite open and quite good. Yep. What size blocks are the average ones you're working on? Um, so the average we're on one at the moment's probably about two thousand squares oh, meters. Right. But majority would probably be around the twelve hundred for 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 us. I mean some some would be a lot larger. Like the one we did in um which took a year, that one was that was huge. That was uh eighty meters from the top to the boathouse. So there was a fair whack trying to get concrete down there. Yeah, they're all pretty good sized blocks. Yeah, generally the high end projects are the bigger ones in those areas. You do get the old boutique one in, in a couple areas, but generally we seem to be drilling quite quite big sizes. It's a lot, a lot of pool work, you know. And they're all concrete pools. Yeah, we we mainly only ever work with um, concrete pool builders. Are there many fiberglass ones go, that go in? Heaps at the moment. Yeah, yeah. My brother-in-law actually lives down down the down the line a little bit, and that's what he does. Yeah, yeah. He's putting in t- two or three a week, sort of thing. There's, yeah, there's, no. there's heaps going in. Yeah, because it's it's only like a three-day process, isn't it? Yeah, it, it's in and out pretty quick. The main part, uh, yeah. And and it's just a lot cheaper for most people. Yeah. Is there a massive lead time on them? Because I know over here that you're looking at uh, nine to twelve months to get a fiberglass pool. Well, uh, I don't think it's that long, but you it would be at least three. If you're not waiting three months, you'd probably have to question. Mm. That's all it was. Yeah, um, it's just that busy. What's the soil like there? Uh, it varies everywhere, but where we are, like, there's one part of the city which is known for its volcanic rock. Which is you just can't price anything around there because you never know what you're going to hit. Mm. But generally, it's quite solid clay. Yeah, a lot, a lot of clay. Yep. Uh, and what about stone? Did you use natural stone for our any projects? We personally don't use a lot of it. A lot of our designers are probably a bit more formal than than that look. Uh, we did use a little bit on one project last year. Well, it might have been two years ago now, but it was only a couple feature feature rocks, uh, maybe half a dozen. Now, but, what about uh, the paving that you use? What are you What are you using most of the time? Depending on the a lot of porcelain at the moment is is in, and then we've just laid a crazy paving path, which was uh, of patio, which was Sagala from Eco Outdoors, All right. which which wasn't too bad. It was quite consistent. It was quite easy to use. It all sort of, but around pools, people are sort of starting to go towards your, your um, your porcelain rather than your sort of concrete tiles. Yep. And what's your technique that you use to lay it? So if we were going porcelain, I'd sub out the tile lane, and we'd sort of do the concrete slab, and then and they would glue them down. Yep. And then if it's a um, if it's around a pool and we're still going to concrete pavers. We'd, we'd still pour box and pour the slab, but we'd just lay it on a mud mix. Yep. Now, what's your mud mix consist of? Uh, we go four to one, four sand, one cement. Is that the same way like you were taught to do it, or have you, have you changed the way you do things over the years? No, that's the, that's the same same way I've sort of always been taught. And um, we actually like to just make up a little cement slurry and just paste that on the back of the paver as well. Yeah. Just to give it an extra sort of bond, and we've got some bonding agent in the um in the mud mix as well. Yep, I do that exact same thing with the cement. Put yeah, paste the back of it, and it's amazing how much how well it works when you have to pop pavers for whatever reason. Oh, if, if it's down for twenty minutes and you got to adjust it, eh? You you'll put your back out trying to lift it. Yeah, and then if you don't if uh, if you don't put anything between on the mortar between the mortar and the slab, it just comes off clean. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of people. They, they won't wet them down as well, you know. It sort of mm. needs to 
work down the paver so it actually gets that bond. Yeah, yeah, it's got. To, yeah, that's what I first learned as well because it's got. So it's got to be wet. The pace has still got to be wet when you lay it when you put it down. Yeah. So yeah, it really locks it in together. Yeah, it, it's a great. That sticks like anything, eh? Mm. Uh, what about the? Uh, I saw you did a pretty fancy bench seat recently. It was like a board form concrete and then um, some tubular, like steel going through the timber. Was that was that designed like that and all all uh, drawn up and you just had to do what they said, or do you make that up as you go? Um, so the drawing was there, but we sort of had to make it up as as we went. So I had to go. I actually bought a drill press for that, which is not something you ever sort of think you need in landscaping. Um, I've got three of them. Cause I, oh, do you? Because <laughs> we had a lot of holes to drill, and so I wanted to get through a quicker. So there was three of us doing it all at once. Oh, it makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So um, yeah. So yeah, we just sort of we had an idea of how we wanted to do it, and then sort of just gave it a go. And there was a bit of tweaking. And there was a another another guy that I sort of just follow on Instagram. And I saw he did something similar, so I just sort of messaged him and asked him where he got the, the tube from and whatnot. And we now done found some, and we just yeah, we just had a threaded rod through the middle, and then the tube just hit it, and then we just sort of bolted it, tied it from each end, and then plugged all the holes. Yep. So yeah, so it was a piece of rod going all the way through the like they were uh, timber battens, and so then those you had like uh, the stainless steel. Well, they cut the short lengths where they like as, as a spacer. Yeah, yeah. So we we cut those all on the droppy. We just brought a long a long roll and yeah, cut it cut it on the droppy. Yeah, cool. sort of, it looks awesome. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with how that one turned out. And sort of the designer came and he was happy and he sort of said, like, next time he's going to make a bigger one. Oh. So <laughs> Lucky you got a so, drill press. I know, right? <laughs> any excuse to buy another tool, though. Exactly. Have you got any machines or anything like that that you use that you own? We've uh, got a 1.5 excavator. Yep. Which has been a game changer for us as well. I probably should have bought that first before I even brought my ute to start work. Yeah, right. Because that's just it's just saves so much time, and we used to hire them, but then you'd only use them for that day, and you know you're sort of thinking, this, if I don't get this back, I'm paying for it. Mm. So now we sort of just take it to site and leave it on site until it's needed somewhere else. Because if you get something delivered, you just you just scoop and move it. Yep. Do you load and barrels with it as well? Yep. Yep. So you just get a couple guys on the go and just one person loading them up and and it, it just saves you it saves the backs yeah um it's kind of maybe a little bit lazy landscaping but it's a bit smarter everyone goes home a bit happier exactly yeah it's all it's yeah there's nothing lazy about it it's a bit smart like you could you know lift up heavy things as well because that's harder but it's yeah that's not smarter either yeah exactly uh what about uh, is there any landscape association in new zealand that you're a part of not that i'm a part of i'm just in the process of joining it Yes, just the registered master landscapers. So I've sort of been following them for a little bit and sort of just been trying to find the time to, to join them. So I'm just in the process of, of doing that now because um, we actually sort of want to start putting a couple projects up for awards. Yep. And this is where you'll get them recognised. So, mm. just, uh, uh, And what's licensing like? Is, is, do you have to have a, a licensing a license for landscaping? Not for landscaping, no. So it'd be nice if there was, but a lot of this trades in the landscaping you do. So for our block walls and things like that, if there's any engineering plans, it has to be done by a, a registered block layer. And then some of our projects have had a bit of building work, so they're being licensed builders. So then we just sort of have to subby that out. But in terms of actually just doing the landscaping, there's there's nothing that says what you can and can't do. Is there any talk of that changing? I would like it to change because a lot of us have done our time and it just will make you a cut above the rest. Mm. Yeah, I, I think it should change. It, it'd just be better for the industry, I think. Really, <laughs> landscapers haven't sort of they've been pushed to the side a little bit and I think now they're sort of coming through and people are spending the money. And um, it'd be better to be one of those top ones. Yeah. Well, when you look at all the different things you do within landscaping, and then you see that just anyone can do it, it's uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense. No, it's it's just frustrating as well. You see people that um, 
so their landscapers and they trim hedges and, and mow lawns. Yeah. <laughs> that really just grinds my gears, you know. But yeah. it's you do maintain that you're not a landscaper, so it'd be nice if it changed. Yeah, it's a completely different set of skills. Like the what they do, I can't do. So guard maintenance people have got more skills in their job than what I do. In so yeah, there's nothing wrong with either one. But yeah, one of my hey most annoying thing is when people, well, I'll tell someone I'm a landscaper and they say, oh, you can come around and mow my lawn. <laughs> I used to get called a gardener. Um, yep. And, then, you know, it's like, oh, how's the gardening going? And that one just. <laughs> exactly the same. <laughs> like my um, my kids will call me that just to annoy me. They call me the gardener. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. with the, with having four staff on, do you do anything outside of work to keep everyone happy or just to keep morale up and that sort of thing? Uh, we sort of, we did a fishing charter last year and we, I'm just about to book another one just for the sort of Christmas do. Yep. But we don't do a lot, as much as I want. I sort of just said to the guys, I want maybe every two to three months, a different person picks a different activity because with our varied ages and things like that, sometimes, oh, I don't want to do that or I don't want to do that. So I'm going to get the guys to, to pick something and then we do it and then it rolls on to the next person. Yep. It's a good idea. Uh, I think it's yeah, it'd be nice. I want to do it. Yep. Now, do you have any uh, any issues with earthquakes? Like, do you have to do anything specific for for them? Not in our region, but a lot of things. These like it doesn't say it on the engineered plans that it's sort of for earthquakes. But I've seen the yeah the geotechs and the engineers have certainly gone a lot harder over the last sort of five years. Um, yep. The footy sizes and the steel details definitely ramped up yeah so they're sort of covering themselves but doesn't sort of say just in case yeah so what sort of what's an example of what a normal deck footing would be or a deck footing for like a block wall uh like, no like a, if you're doing a timber deck oh for a timber deck we for sort of post. um just about 500 deep into solid clay and then we sort of keep our span for our um, piles at about 1500 and then we do a double double joist on top of that, a uh, double bearer on top of that, then then a single joist at every sort of four hundred. Yep. Yeah, it's pretty similar. We yeah, we even we have to go a bit deeper than that. So yeah, there's not nothing too crazy then, is there? No, no, it's all for for that. It's all right. It's more like your um, concrete block retaining walls. Yep. So if any of those are load bearing, like some of the footings for like a six hundred high wall have sort of stretched out to sometimes eight hundred wide. Yeah. Right. Must- Got a, got in a bit, yeah. Sometimes it's a bit crazy. Yeah, the ones we're doing at the moment. So, like, if it's a, a meter high block retaining wall, you have got to go down six hundred fifty mil deep. So, like, it's six hundred fifty mil deep and three hundred mil wide trench. Then you've also got a um, a nine hundred mil toe or heel on it. So, and that's two hundred mil thick. So it comes out another nine hundred mil past that. So it's about um, twelve hundred mil wide. And 200 will thick the whole way so yeah, they're pretty intense that's that's a lot more extreme than what we're doing yeah so it can't it's tip like, over it, it never sort of would anyway it, yeah it definitely would be going nowhere not yet no nah, not now well, yeah not a big toe or heel on there and then what's um waterproof behind it and then you've got got a nova coil or something like that square up behind before yep. you back yeah, yeah exactly that um yeah, it's, like I can understand why they need to go crazy because you can't design something that just barely meets, you know, whatever their target is. So you're a bit off being too strong and not not strong enough. Yeah. So what's the future look like for the business? Do you plan on having any more staff at all or is the number you got good? No, I would like to grow and have two separate teams. I'd like to take on another foreman so I can step back and then sort of take on another apprentice and sort of grow from there. I think that would be my ideal number. Um, that'd give me just plenty of time to sort of step back a little bit so I could do two to three days on the tools, a couple of days in the office, but also get across everything because I'm quite on. I need to see all the finished products and yeah. just how everything's going before I can sort of sign off on it. Yeah, the, yeah I'm a bit fussy over the detail. Yeah, that's fair enough, though, because look, that's that's an example of what uh, when someone starts a business because they they like doing the landscape, it's not because you want to 
be in charge of people, you actually want to see the products completed. So I'm, I'm exactly the same. I want to see everything done. Yeah, I think it's a good way. Like uh, some of my guys, the younger one, um, the apprentice, he's like, oh, does this look all right to, all right to you? And if I say, if you, if you have to ask me, you, you know the answer. It's, it's probably not. Yes. So take another look and, and, and do it again. Yeah. Uh, it sort of it, it goes without, you know. If they're coming over to me and saying, oh, look how good this is, you know, then you know it's going to be on the money. Mm, yeah. Are there any apps that you use for the business? No, I've just started using WhatsApp, WhatsApp for just communication. So I've just sort of started loading up every job onto that and just started playing with zero projects. Yep. Just I need to sort of start getting a bit more involved in tracking tracking that and seeing, seeing how we're going because there seems to be a lot of work, but the bank account doesn't pile up. So it's a matter <laughs> of just finding that uh, happy medium. Yep. Yeah, so in the past, you so you haven't been doing any job job tracking at all. No, not really. Like just a little bit, just but sort of just a quick quick write it down sort of thing. But generally, it's just too quick onto the next one. And because yeah. I'm on the full time, I don't have a chance to then go back and catch up. Yep. Yeah. So that's something you can work on once you get those extra guys on, so that you can be less on site. Yeah, that's that's the main goal. And then it'd be nice to sort of get home and be home yeah you know not have dinner with the family and then oh time to work again yeah that has business been crazy since covid started with being really busy yeah yeah we've been sort of i'm turning work away unfortunately at the moment just because uh if people aren't willing to wait and we can't get there and that's a shame because there's some a couple of projects i really wanted to do but we're just too committed to other other projects. So maybe, yeah, maybe a couple of guys that would could certainly help and we can do it a lot more. And what sort of time frame you booked out to? We are generally a three to four month wait. Yeah, I generally generally sit around that, um, which is good because most of our projects are sort of six six weeks. And then every now and then a designer will pop up with something something little you know so you sort of squeeze that into sort of help them out mm. if there's any product that need engineering are you organizing all of that and any permits generally our designers take care of all of that so generally when the client comes to us it's normally the it's either in consent or the projects come out of consent from the council and then um, we take it from there, and that's where all the engineering drawings will be on. So, yeah, most of the designers have that in their fees. They'll take care of that. And what sort of distance do you travel for work? Like how far would you go? We travel, it takes oh, about an hour, purely because of traffic, like half an hour there in the morning, sort of maybe an hour on the way home. I, we tend to work in the city. That's just where the sort of projects we're on. And I live a bit further out from there. So, yeah, we're traveling about an hour each way each day. So, a bit of time for your podcast, mate. Oh, nice. Do you listen to any, is there any other ones you listen to? Uh, I listen to the High Performance Podcast. I've sort of been listening to that a little bit. I yeah. found that pretty good. It talks to sports stars and entrepreneurs and just everything about sort of how they became high performance. So I learned quite a lot of tricks from there. Any audio books? No, I, re I do still read paper, the old hard copy. Yeah. So I've just sort of finished Matthew McConaughey's Green Lights. Oh, yeah. Nothing to do with, like, business or anything, but that was, that was, I found that a great read. Um, so that'd be, that'd be a definite one you'd want to hear on the audio book to hear his voice. Oh, funny great. you say that. I do sort of listen to his sleep stories. And um, right. I hope my wife doesn't listen to him to this but yeah she gives me a hard time because i've got a bit of a his voice just it's so good yeah <laughs> it, it just works yeah you could say any any quote and it sounds awesome regardless of what he's saying i know he tells you to snuggle up in bed and you're like oh instant you know be, be, be. <laughs> have you ever had a business coach or anything like that or anyone to help out with business or you just been learning as you go i've been learning as i go but it's something i've been wanting to do for a while now and I've had other friends that have sort of did it early on in their careers, 
completely different trades and their business has just been so good for it. Yeah. So it's on, it's on my list for start of next year. I'm going to sort of get into that and just want to learn how we can be more efficient, which I think will just flow onto everything, onto the accounts, onto the guys, and just I think I think we can make things a lot easier and a lot smarter. So the coaches definitely definitely come in. What do you like at planning? Do you plan like a whole week where everyone's going to be and what they're doing? Or try to, try to, but mm-hmm. um. Yeah, we generally have a weekly goal, but then sometimes, you know, that first day throws it all out. We yeah. still always try and meet it, but yeah, we, we, we generally have a target and uh, hopefully we hit it. Otherwise, you sort of, you have you have your two or three week target and then you're organising the next two or three weeks and just mixing it up. Mm. Yeah, I found, yeah, sometimes when it works, it works amazingly. You think, oh, I should do this all the time. And then, yeah, something goes wrong on the first day and it just throws everything up in the air. And you think, why do I bother spending the time doing it? Because you just got to make it up on the fly anyway. Exactly. Like sometimes you're like, right, if we get these deck posts poured, we can't build on them. So that's us for the day, you know? And then sometimes that just doesn't happen. Every now and then you might get a four o'clock knock, but generally it doesn't go that way. Yeah. Uh, what's the, um, the landscaping industry like in terms of camaraderie between other businesses does everyone get along or is it pretty competitive we in my situation it's pretty it's not competitive at all like sort of i know everyone i've still work with you still get in contact with and you sort of still chat to them you look at their work and we're not really we're not competing for work so i find it pretty easy just to message someone and be like oh what would you do here or you know oh, where'd you get that from that's pretty cool and Everyone, everyone's helpful. Yeah. Um, maybe in this, I think in the smaller zones, like where people do spec houses, I think that would be a little bit different. But in the high end sort of market, everyone sort of helps each other. Yeah, that's awesome. Like, are, are there many people who are, that you know of a member of the landscape association? Just a couple, but I don't. They, they don't get that involved at this at the stage. It was more just sort of it probably helps advertise you a little bit. So hopefully, hopefully when I I want to get involved, just try and find out more and do more and yeah. And then are they designers a part of it as well? Yeah, yeah. So it can be sort of anyone in in the industry. So in the landscape one, the sort of pool builders are also included. Oh yeah. Not block layers or anything like that, but yeah, des- designers and uh, even maintenance as well. Yep, are included. Yeah, because that helps with contacts as well. But so I suppose you don't really need the the work. You've got plenty of that coming in with the ones you got, but that's always a good place to make different contacts. Yeah, and then you sort of you also might see a different design. And you know, if a different design came along, I'd be more than happy to work with that person, you know. If it's yeah. um yeah, if I can buy another drill press or something, you know, like <laughs> more than keen to tr- we want to try new stuff all the time. So that's what I'm looking at. If just more intricate and different designs of would be cool. Yeah. That's what I love doing because I work with different designers and do my own as well, but everything, they're also different. So, yeah, it keeps it keeps it interesting. Yeah, it's good for the guys as well. Otherwise, it's like, you know, same thing, just a different property. Mm. And I think you would you probably would get bored. So, yeah, it's great to mix it up. Yep. Uh, last question for you is who do you think would be a good guest to have on the podcast? Probably my mentor who I first started with. Craig Steiner, but I don't know if he would. Oh. But uh, um, but his knowledge would just be unbelievable. Otherwise, I'd probably say my brother-in-law. He does landscaping in a different part of the country. Yep. And so their styles down there, he's at a beach town, so it's completely different to sort of our style, and he's actually doing a lot of fiberglass pools. So it's Todd from Edge Landscaping down in the mountain. He's, um, and his path into landscaping was a a lot different to mine. Cool. So, yeah, and what was the cover you ever? Was it Strauss, did you say? Strauss. Strauss, Strauss. Landscape. Okay. Cool. I'll check those two out. But, yeah, Neil, can't thank you enough for coming on. I've been trying to get someone from New Zealand on for ages, and everyone else just doesn't reply to me. So I appreciate you replying and also coming on and, uh, and sharing <laughs> no, the story. Don't worry. Um, it's, it's been pretty fun. I've enjoyed it.